I was asked to talk about the cardiomyopathies. Um, so since that's a pretty broad topic, I thought that I would start with just some overview and then mostly focus on the dilated cardiomyopathies, as those can be pretty it can be pretty instructional um, way to look at things. So briefly, we're going to talk about the classification of the cardiomyopathies and then specifically the dilated cardiomyopathies. I'll talk a little bit about epidemiology and natural history, and then we'll go over some uh, specific etiologies in just sort of broad strokes, but things to be aware of. Okay, so the definition of cardiomyopathy specifically is essentially a disease of the heart muscle, whereas you can have ischemic heart disease, valvular heart disease, those are attributed to other factors. This is where truly the myocardium itself is the issue. This um, process results from many different types of insults to the myocardium. So you can have genetic defects, myocyte injury, infiltration. And you can have uh, issues that are inherent themselves to the cardiac myocyte, as well as external processes that can result in a cardiomyopathy. So you can have deposition of abnormal substances into the extracellular matrix. Um, <clears throat> or an issue with the cardiac myocyte itself. And we define the cardio cardiomyopathies based on structural and functional phenotypes. This issue, as you'll see when I sort of go through the classification, <clears throat> has become more and more challenging as far as how to define and classify the cardiomyopathies because our understanding of the molecular um, issues and the pathophysiology continue to become uh, more broad and we become to um, know more about the molecular issues, we have essentially a harder time creating classifications uh, for these types of uh, myocardial diseases. So there really is no uh, truly uh, universally accepted way to classify the cardiomyopathies. I'll present a couple of them that I think can be a helpful way to think about this disease. So this is a, um, a graph that shows, or a table shows actually the dilated cardiomyopathies are one type of cardiomyopathy. Then hypertrophic cardiomyopathy restrictive and then increasingly we're coming to, to uh, recognize these sort of right ventricular myopathies and arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy being one of the um, best known and well common. And then this sort of unclassified cardiomyopathy category. So we'll focus mostly for today's purposes on the dilated cardiomyopathies. And one way to think of this is that a dilated cardiomyopathy is, is kind of the end common pathway for a lot of processes. So even you'll see restrictive and hypertrophic cardiomyopathies will often end up in the end stages with the uh, phenotype and clinical characteristics of a dilated cardiomyopathy, even though they started out with very different uh, mechanisms and pathophysiology. So that's why I'll sort of focus here for today's lecture. So another way to sort of break down the primary cardiomyopathies um, is depicted in this graph, which shows that you can have genetic cardiomyopathies, which includes the HCM or hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is the arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, LV non-compaction, and so on. You can have the acquired here on this side, uh, which includes inflammatory, stress-induced, peripartum, tachycardia-induced are the most common, and then you can have a mixed sort of component. So dilated cardiomyopathy um, sort of broadly is include, included here because that can often be genetic or acquired, and then a restrictive cardiomyopathy can fall into this category as well. So a little bit about that in kind of a different way of looking at it. If we look at this pie graph here, this will show sort of all of the causes of cardiomyopathy. Ischemic heart disease is very common, makes up almost half. Uh, 
Valvular heart disease and hypertensive heart disease are a smaller piece of the pie, and dilated cardiomyopathies make up about 35 to 40% of the cardiomyopathies that we'll see. And within those dilated cardiomyopathies, there are multiple different etiologies, as I showed briefly in the previous slide. And here, if we look more closely, you'll see that about half of the dilated cardiomyopathies are what we term idiopathic. And as we're coming to learn more about genetics uh, and uh, inheritance of cardiomyopathies, we'll find that of those, probably about 40% can be contributed uh, to some type of genetic underlying or considered familial. And then <clears throat> sort of this other category is made up of tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy, congenital heart disease, stress-related, and Chagas disease, which we don't see much of here, but um, in other parts of the world, this is a, one of the most common causes of dilated cardiomyopathy. And then myocarditis makes up about 10% of the dilated cardiomyopathies, and then other etiologies here sort of fall into these smaller categories. So toxins, peripartum, infiltrative, HIV, chemotherapy, which we could have, you know, each of these we could have an entire um, hour lecture on, on alone, um, but we'll go over some of these uh, that are important uh, it specifically in a bit. Okay, so the key principle when you're thinking about um, the patient evaluation and sort of how to classify the dilated cardiomyopathies is just to understand that there's many primary, secondary, and systemic disorders that manifest with cardiac dysfunction or congestive heart failure. And you'd want to undergo a comprehensive evaluation for a broad array of disorders uh, that could potentially be causing the cardiomyopathy. With your, your thought that the main goal is going to be identifying disorders that cause reversible cardiac dysfunction so that you can treat the underlying cause. So that's the idea, even though everything sort of looks like it ends in this uncommon pathway of dilated cardiomyopathy, within that, you do have the potential to reverse the cardiomyopathy and thus the patient's ultimate outcome. And that's what we're looking for when we try to classify uh, and identify the underlying etiology. Here's another reason that it's important to try to classify and also uh, identify the underlying etiology so you can potentially treat it. This is a graph that depicts the prognosis as it uh, for cardiomyopathy as it pertains to some of the um, sort of bigger, uh, broader picture of um, different etiologies. So you'll see up here, so this is proportion of patients surviving on the y-axis, and on the x, it's looking at uh, years since diagnosis, looking out to about 15 years. So you'll see that peripartum cardiomyopathy, folks tend to do quite well, um, very uh, high survival over the ensuing 15 years. This group of idiopathic cardiomyopathy um, has uh, about 60% uh, sort of survival at 15 years. Ischemic heart disease, which is a little bit in a different category as we talked about, but just to give you a context, lies here. And then doxorubicin therapy, infiltrative heart disease and cardiomyopathy due to HIV infection sort of all have decreasing proportion of survival. So it can inform what the potential prognosis is uh, based on the underlying etiology for the cardiomyopathy. So we'll talk a little bit about the pathophysiology. Um, essentially, a dilated cardiomyopathy is described by enlargement of one or both ventricles as well as systolic dysfunction. And it's important to note that the dilation of the ventricles can precede any onset of symptoms, so it can potentially be uh, incidentally found, and the patient may not necessarily have signs or symptoms of heart failure. This picture is a, um, is a gross uh, uh, pathology of a normal heart here on the left, and on the right, uh, heart with dilated cardiomyopathy. As you can see, the heart in general, in total, is much whoops, much larger than the normal heart on the left. In this example, we have dilation of all chambers. And then the other thing to note is that there, be, there comes to have this more sort of spherical shape 
to the ventricles as compared to the normal heart. And this is sort of classic um, finding of end-stage dilated cardiomyopathy. Looking a little closer at the um, pathology of the dilated cardiomyopathy, this is sort of a, that same or similar um, specimen that we saw in the previous slide just now uh, sliced. And you see dilation of both ventricles and sort of this spherical shape here um, of the ventricles as well, and then uh, relatively thin ventricular walls. This is the same dilated cardiomyopathy depicted on cardiac MRI. This is mostly uh, focused on the LV, but this left ventricle is extremely uh, dilated and uh, spherical in shape, and again with the thin walls. And then here on the bottom in C, this is a normal histopathology of cardiac myocytes. Compared here next to it in D, this is the histopathology of a dilated cardiomyopathy where you have sort of this hypertrophy of the cardiac myocytes and it's very they're very irregular as well in position. And then you also have this fibrotic uh, deposition within the myocytes. And this is what um, is going on on a, on a microscopic level. The main um, sort of uh, underlying pathophysiology of the development of the dilated chambers is the concept of eccentric remodeling. So as the heart, uh, heart walls become un placed under stress, there's an increase in sort of wall tension. So the radius of the chamber increases over time and the thickness of the wall decreases over time in an effort to minimize the wall stress on, on the heart. And initially this is a sort of a compensatory mechanism and the heart is able to compensate and provide appropriate cardiac output through this method. But over time, it reaches a tipping point where it's not able to compensate any longer and then the patient will present with symptoms of congestive heart failure. And on a microscopic level, this is a depiction of a normal um, cardiac myocytes here compared to cardiac myocytes in a dilated cardiomyopathy. So these cardiac myocytes become elongated and that's due to the sarcomeres being formed in series uh, in an effort to create what we're seeing here on the left, uh, this increase in chamber size and uh, decrease in the wall thickness. So the natural history for dilated cardiomyopathy is very variable and really incompletely understood. And that's basically due to the fact that there are many underlying causes and that the presentations are quite variable depending on the underlying cause. And the impact of therapy, um, you know, it seems to be uh, really changing the course depending on the underlying etiology. But when we talk about or think about guideline-directed medical therapy, we really do see that there's been an impact over the over the last several decades. So the one-year mortality in the placebo arm of this consensus trial in the 1980s was about 50%. So that was in the 80s before we had many options for guideline-directed medical therapy. And then later in another large heart failure trial, Copernicus, um, in the 1990s and the 2000s, we see that the one-year mortality went down in the similar patient profile group to 20% and then ultimately in the 2000s to about 10% mortality in a year. So we really have made strides in, in um, changing the course of the disease and the mortality over the past few decades. The mainstay of that therapy, which I talked about in the prior um, talk that I gave, I think last month in much further detail is neurohormonal blockade. And what we try to achieve with the neural hormonal blockade is this concept of reversed left ventricular remodeling, which essentially tries to um, counter effect what we saw in the prior slide 
of this chamber dilation that is happening in an effort to decrease wall stress. So the evaluation, this is going to come up in a very strange way, I apologize, but I try to just sort of put out, you know, I'll, I'll give you some other uh, charts as well to look at, but this has sort of been, in my mind, some of the top aspects of what I think about when I meet a patient with a, with a newly identified dilated cardiomyopathy. And this will highlight some of the common causes, and then you'll sort of uh, come to see a little bit why uh, some of these com uh, components are very important. So initially in the history, I always ask about a recent febrile illness. And recent can even mean like three or six months ago. You want to sort of find out when their symptoms started and then think, have them think back to three to six months before their symptoms started to, to remember if they had any type of febrile illness or sort of systemic illness, which can suggest that the etiology might be related to uh, myocarditis picture. You want to get a good family history, uh, so usually three generations thinking about uh, heart failure presentations in patients um, with dilated cardiomyopathy and first degree relatives. Um, you know, they'll often talk, patients will often tell you about cousins and things. It's sort of more the first degree relatives that are helpful, so parents, grandparents. And because a lot of these things, you know, a lot of these diagnoses we are really more recently coming to, to recognize, ask about other things too. So not just heart failure, but did anybody ever say that people in your family had an enlarged heart? Or did anybody die, you know, if they say that folks died of a heart attack, uh, a lot of times that can potentially be heart failure that just wasn't recognized, or that's just sort of a common, um, you know, term that people use. Um, sudden cardiac death is, an, is also a helpful history to try to elicit. So getting kind of um, acting sort of like a detective and trying to kind of figure out what some of those prior diagnoses might have been. Asking the patient about syncope palpitation can help clarify or help um, trigger if this could be an arrhythmic, cardio, uh, arrhythmic cardiomyopathy. And then asking for travel, exposures, drug use, or cancer chemotherapy can also be helpful. The initial tests that I'll send usually include um, the chemistries to see what the renal function looks like. Um, which is helpful for thinking about systemic disease that could be an etiology, but also for how we're going to treat um, if, depending on if they have normal renal function or not. A CBC with differentials helpful to look for something like eosinophils um, and also to look for white blood cell elevation that could suggest some sort of infectious component. Uh, always send HIV and then Lyme sometimes, um, only if that seems like that might be an important component or the exposure there might be um, brought up by the history. I always send iron studies, an ANA, a calcium, thinking about sarcoid, and then a TSH, and then think about um, some toxicology if that's inappropriate in the history. And then the echo is the first important evaluation for cardiac structure and function. And if you identify a dilated cardiomyopathy with, without really valvular disease or clear wall motion abnormalities, then you'll start to look for sort of specific patterns. Um, is, are the walls thick? Are they, are they thinned out? Uh, does it look like there could be some infiltration there? Is there sort of a starry sky appearance, like with amyloid, for example? You see apical trabeculations. All of these things can give you hints as to what the etiology might be. And then you can think about going towards advanced imaging. So cardiac MRI with uh, late gadolinium enhancement can be very helpful, can tell you about infiltration, can tell you about scar, um, inflammation as well. You can get a good look at non-compaction and then also even get an iron score for iron deposition. An angiogram is, is usually necessary, ischemic uh, Ischemic heart disease is the most common cause of heart failure in this country, so you always want to rule that out, even if um, even if there seem to be other more common reasons. That's one of the first things that you'll do is rule out an ischemic etiology. And biopsy has very uh, narrow indications um, for things that you think are um, on the differential and require very specialized treatment. And this 
what most often falls into this category is someone who comes in with fulminant myocarditis and you're looking for giant cell myocarditis essentially, which will be steroid responsive and life-saving. So that's a really common sort of acute indication for biopsy. If you have a patient with new reduced heart failure and they are not responding to regular heart failure therapies within the first couple of weeks, then biopsy can be considered in those cases. Um, <clears throat> so those are the sort of very narrow indications. So I mentioned cardiac MRI. Cardiac MRI can be very helpful um, to use for looking at late gadolinium enhancement. So you can really get a little bit better sense of what the etiology is of the dilated cardiomyopathy than you can just from echo alone um, based on the uh, late gadolinium enhancement pattern. So if you have mid-wall hyperenhancement, that can suggest an idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy, maybe myocarditis, and epicardial hyperenhancement might suggest something like sarcoid chagas or myocarditis, and then global and endocardial hyperenhancement points in another direction. So I find cardiac MRI to be a very helpful uh, additive evaluation component um, when trying to determine the underlying etiology, and I use it fairly frequently. So we mentioned that the prognosis is really very variable depending on the etiology and the substrate of the patient, as well as how advanced their heart failure is. And this is this uh, table just shows some of the elements that are associated with a poor prognosis and a dilated cardiomyopathy. Probably what you would expect on clinical evaluation, more advanced class heart failure, older, lower exercise peak oxygen consumption, et cetera, et cetera. And then a lot of the findings of um, uh, congestion. A non-invasive, a particularly low LV ejection fraction can be a poor prognostic fi finding, especially if there's not improvement with guideline-directed medical therapy. Market LV dilation uh, also portends a poor prognosis and um, usually also portends or um, indicates uh, chronicity, so the process that has been going on for quite some time. Um, and then on invasive evaluation, high LV filling pressures. And, and the other things noted here have all been associated with uh, adverse outcome or poor prognosis. So treatment, in general, the therapies for dilated cardiomyopathy is basically um, usually therapy for heart failure. So guideline-directed medical therapy, which we've also talked about in my prior talk, uh, treating or addressing volume status or congestion symptoms, and then initiating neurohormonal blockade to the maximum tolerated doses. And it's really only recently that we have some specific etiology-based therapies that are beginning to enter into our practice. Um, and I, you know, that will hopefully continue to grow so that we'll have additional options. So I'll switch gears a little bit to talk about some of these specific cardiomyopathies. And many of the ones that I'll talk about initially are the ones that are um, usually reversible and therefore um, am very important to know about that uh, aspect that they're reversible and what therapies are, are necessary. So the first that I'll talk about is alcoholic cardiomyopathy. We'll just go over that briefly. So this in the Western world is one of the leading causes of non-ischemic dilated cardiomyopathy. So it's important to be aware of. The mechanism is thought to be really a direct toxic effect of alcohol on the cardiac myosis. And then in addition, toxic effects of the alcohol metabolites. So acetaldehyde is also a direct toxin to the cardiac myocytes. Patients that drink to a high enough degree to cause a cardiomyopathy often also have nutritional deficiencies. So thymine and selenium are common and can certainly lead to LV dysfunction. And then electrolyte disturbances. And sometimes in the in alcohol there can be some there can be um, levels of toxic additives that become toxic levels with the amount that they're drinking. So the risk of developing alcoholic cardiomyopathy 
is proportional, sort of like dose responsive, so proportional to the quantity and the duration of the patient's exposure to alcohol. So I think that it is very often invoked, or alcohol is very often invoked as the etiology for an LV, uh, for a dilated cardiomyopathy, probably a little bit more often than it, than it is. Um, you really have to drink a lot of alcohol to, uh, to end up with a dilated cardiomyopathy from alcohol intake alone. Um, so it's thought to be more than 80 grams of ethanol per day for more than five years. So that's equivalent to a liter of wine, eight beers, half a pint of hard liquor. Um, it's, it, I think it, it can be less for women. Um, this is actually invoked a lot. Uh, and what happens is I think it's fair to invoke alcohol as the cause of dilated cardiomyopathy if the patient is a heavy drinker. And then counseling the patient on abstaining from alcohol completely, introducing the guideline-directed medical therapy, and then usually you'll see an improvement in LV function once they're abstinent, even sooner than six months, but usually by six months. I'll usually recheck in about three months of abstinence, recheck the LV function. And if the LV, if the dilated cardiomyopathy is from alcohol, it should essentially resolve or improve quite substantially. And if it doesn't, then I usually look for other causes of the cardiomyopathy. So this might be the case where then I would go and do, um, you know, if, it, if an ischemic eval hasn't already been done, which usually it is, then I'd often go and do a cardiac MRI. And in, in some instances, you'll find that actually there's a structural uh, etiology going on. I had a recent patient where alcoholic cardiomyopathy was invoked. He really abstained. We had him on GDMT and he really had no improvement in his function over the next four to six months, and then cardiac MRI revealed LV non-compaction as the etiology. So I think it's good to invoke it, and I always tell patients, you know, it only helps to stop drinking because you don't need to add additional toxin um, or additional toxic uh, effect to your heart muscles when it's already damaged. And then if it gets better, that's great. Um, so that's an important cause of cardiomyopathy to know about, but to also know that if it doesn't get better with true abstinence, we have to look for something else. Okay, myocarditis is a huge topic, but it is a very common cause of dilated cardiomyopathy that is often reversible uh, and improves over time. So I'll briefly go over uh, this concept as well. Myocarditis usually is, is triggered from an external inflammatory trigger, usually a virus, which induces um, the patient's uh, own um, response. There's a spectrum from minimally transient response of the patient's immune system to a fulminant overwhelming inflammation, and that is the fulminant myocarditis presentation where you can come in with electrical instability as well as cardiogenic shock. This is a graphic depiction of the, excuse me, pathophysiology of myocarditis. Essentially, there are considered to be three phases. So there's the acute phase where the virus or toxin is introduced. There's initial myocyte energy injury from the pathen, pathogen or the toxin, and then you have immune activation uh, triggered by that initial exposure. Then there's an acquired immune response, so antibodies to pathogens, antibodies that are created to the initial pathogen can then cross-react towards your own cardiac muscle, essentially, so you can sort of have this ongoing damage in the second phase. And then you can have recovery most often, so the virus is most often cleared and you have the down regulation of that immune response. Or you can have this more sort of chronic myocarditis phase where you have ongoing inner injury and this persistent either presence of the viral infection or persistent immune response to your own tissues.
So this is a diagnostic and treatment algorithm for myocarditis. So again, you have this sort of viral phase, then the immune response, which is followed by either remodeling and repair or sort of ongoing injury. We talked about innate, we talked about the immunity response, and I wanted to highlight here uh, some of the diagnostic workup. So in rare instances, again, um, uh, endomyocardial biopsy is indicated. If the patient comes in in fulminant myocarditis or with significant arrhythmic instability, that's one of the indications for myocardial biopsy. And then cardiac MRI is very helpful in this setting as well, which we'll go over. And then the therapy in general is ACE, ARB, and the, uh, the routine guideline-directed medical therapy, uh, supportive care with mechanical support if necessary to maintain organ perfusion. Sometimes immunosuppression is indicated, and usually in those fulminant presentations, we'll consider it, and for a very specific etiologies such as giant cell myocarditis. We don't usually treat the antiviral agents unless it's causing systemic effect, um, effect as well. And this is what myocarditis looks like. There's a Dallas criteria when you look at the endomyocardial biopsy under, um, under the microscope, basically this large influx of immune response and um, lymphocytic cells. <clears throat> and then on cardiac MRI, you can often see um, this late gadolinium enhancement as well in very specific patterns will suggest that the dilated cardiomyopathy or LV dysfunction is due to uh, myocarditis. The late gadolinium enhancement can persist for about three months, even longer after the initial presentation. So in practice, when we invoke myocarditis as uh, the etiology of heart failure in a patient that we're seeing inpatient, it can be very challenging to get a cardiac MRI done during an inpatient stay. And in this case, if the patient's otherwise stable and it's really just informing sort of prognosis, um, I'll often wait until outpatient to have this cardiac MRI done to add information to the potential etiology and prognosis, but uh, it's not necessary, because that late gadolinium enhancement abnormality will persist, it's not absolutely necessary to be done during the inpatient admission. Okay, so another um, etiology to be aware of that is reversible if, if appropriately identified and treated is tachycardia-induced cardiomyopathy. So this is, uh, an, ED, uh, an entity where you get LV dysfunction from a prolonged and sustained elevated heart rate. It's typically related to incessant tachycardia, so the heart rate incessantly above 100 beats per minute, very often from atrial fibrillation or a supraventricular tachycardia. It's not typically seen with something like physiologic um, sinus tachycardia. And this uh, cardiomyopathy is essentially reversible with control of the arrhythmia or the ventricular rate. One thing to consider, and so that's usually in about two months. So once you actually get the heart rate controlled, uh, usually within a couple of months, I'll recheck the uh, function and that should be reversed if the heart rate or arrhythmia is appropriately controlled. You always wanna consider thyrotoxicosis so hyperthyroidism is, is a very common um, uh, thing to consider. And then there is a variant where you can have just frequent ventricular ectopy, so frequent PVCs. And it's most likely to be due to PVCs if the PVCs are making up greater than 20% of the total QRS complexes seen. So if you do a 24-hour Holter monitor, you'll get a result of the total number of QRS complexes that were analyzed and then a percentage of that made up of PVCs. And if you have LV dysfunction and PVCs making up greater than 20% of the total beats, then you should consider suppressing, excuse me, suppressing those PVCs, which is not something that we'll usually do just for symptoms, unless for symptoms, or consider even um, 
PVC ablation if the LV dysfunction persists. All right, peripartum cardiomyopathy, again, is another reversible, potentially and usually, uh, cause of dilated cardiomyopathy. So we'll go over that here. Um, essentially, this is sort of a diagnosis of exclusion. So peripartum cardiomyopathy is heart failure without any other obvious etiology identified that occurs within one month prior to delivery and up to five, some places you'll see reported six months postpartum. It's relatively rare in this country, about one in 2,000 to one in 4,000 live births in the U.S. will be complicated with peripartum cardiomyopathy in the mother. And there are lots of hypotheses as to why this occurs, either inflammatory, genetic, and um, more recently, a vascular hypothesis has developed. And there are sort of a common um, uh, risk factors to look for. So age greater than 30, multiparity, African-American, and then pregnancy with multiple fetuses, so twins, um, are, are more common to, uh, to then develop peripartum cardiomyopathy in the mother. A baseline history of hypertension, even if not necessarily just during pregnancy, but chronic hypertension, and then preeclampsia during pregnancy, cocaine use, and then there are some reports that prolonged tocolytic during uh, delivery can potentially increase the, or has been associated with the increased rate of peripartum cardiomyopathy. So there's this concept that's emerging that considers this sort of angiogenic imbalance or an abnormality of the um, blood vessels in late pregnancy. And this factor, the soluble antivascular factor has been identified, um, or SFLT1, as potentially a driver of peripartum cardiomyopathy. And this is released by the placenta in late pregnancy. And then you can see in the schematic here on the right, Placenta releases SFLT, which blocks VEGF. And we can then have an increase in microvascular hemostasis. At the same time, you're sort of having um, effects of the pituitary gland, which is blocking bromocryptine. And it's thought that there's some combination of these elements, mainly focused in on this SFLT1, which in animal models has been shown to be very um, uh, central to the disease, um, where we come up with this diagnosis that occurs mostly in late pregnancy or soon after delivery. So <clears throat> because it's rare, we have studies where we look at sort of the long-term outcome of this uh, type of cardiomyopathy in relatively small numbers of patients, but in general, you can consider that about half of patients will recover their ejection fraction completely. About 40% will have some degree of persistent LV dysfunction. Uh, and then a very small percentage will end up needing something like transplantation or actually dying from this process. And one of the common questions becomes, uh, if a patient has had peripartum cardiomyopathy, can they have another pregnancy? And the biggest predictor of a poor outcome or recurrent heart failure or worsening heart failure with a subsequent pregnancy is what has happened with the ejection fraction after the initial event of peripartum cardiomyopathy. So we see here on the y-axis percent with relapse or worsening heart failure, and then along the x-axis, left ventricular ejection fraction. So essentially, if your ejection fraction normalizes after the initial event, so here greater than 55%, the relative risk of having further worsening or sort of re-reduction in your, in your ejection fraction is relatively low comparatively. So if this is the only factor that we're evaluating for a patient that wants um, some sort of preconception counseling on if it's safe to try to have another pregnancy, if their ejection fraction has fully recovered, then it may be considered 
I think it's really hard to say for sure, but it may be considered. And then 45% tends to be sort of the cutoff where if it's below 45%, the ejection fraction after the death settles from their first from their event of peripartum cardiomyopathy, then the risk of having worsening heart failure is very high. It's almost 70%. So those patients should really be counseled to not pursue another pregnancy and use contraception because they have a very high likelihood of having recurrent and worsening heart failure with another pregnancy. The other factor to consider is that oftentimes these folks are on guideline-directed medical therapy, of which many of the agents are not indicated during pregnancy. So you sort of have the double, uh, double whammy of having a recurrent pregnancy and potentially needing to withdraw medications that they've been on that's helping improve their ejection fraction. So it's a pretty risky area. All right, stress-induced cardiomyopathy often also um, is a very common presentation of dilated cardiomyopathy. So we'll go over that. Um, we see it quite a bit now, um, and it's a, usually a dilated cardiomyopathy, which results from stressful or emotional situation or an exposure to high levels of catecholamines or sympathomimetic drugs. Very common in middle-aged women. That's sort of the, very, the common demographic that you'll see. And then most cases are fully reversible if you provide appropriate supportive care. You can make this diagnosis when you have EKG findings of an MI with LV dysfunction in the absence of epicardial coronary stenosis that defines these sort of wall motion abnormalities or LV dysfunction, and that should prompt the, di prompt the diagnosis. And this is an example here um, by LV Graham where you have sort of hyper, um, hyper function here at the base and then this dilation of the mid ventricle to apex. And you can have different uh, patterns of this where you can have sort of the apex is hyper contractile and the base is what is dilated. Um, so it can have a sort of variable presentation. Um, and then this is what this looks like here on cardiac MRI as well with a um, pattern of, of late cardiac, uh, late gadolinium enhancement. All right, I'll talk briefly about HIV cardiomyopathy also. So the incidence of HIV cardiomyopathy is pre-highly active antiretroviral therapy. Observational studies described that about 15% of the patients in this in at that time developed a dilated cardiomyopathy. Four percent had just an isolated RV uh, myopathy, and four percent were found to have borderline LV dysfunction. And a dilated cardiomyopathy was really strongly associated with a CD4 count of less than 100. And um, any type of LV dysfunction was associated with a CD4 count of less than 400. It was, it's reported as relatively common in children that are infected with HIV. So mother to child um, transmission was one of the entities that was described. And there's many different potential causes. Um, so myocarditis in this setting has been the best studied. And you can have direct action of the virus on the myocardial tissues, but then also proteolytic enzymes or cytokine mediators that are induced by HIV alone or in conjunction with other types of infecting viruses. So there's multiple etiologies um, that have been described. And this is just a quick schematic of the possible causes as there are many. So sometimes there's also multiple additional uh, etiologies and than just the virus itself. Um, and I was trying to find some more recent information. You know, the incident seems to have gone down with the use of anti highly active antiretroviral therapy, but the prognosis is still really poor uh, when this is identified. And it hasn't completely um, declined as much as one might think. 
with the high, uh, highly active antiretroviral therapies, because there are, you know, not just, it's not just the virus alone that causes the cardiomyopathy, there's multiple other factors associated. So treatment is essentially adjunctive treatment uh, for HIV itself, intensifying the antiretroviral therapy, and then the guideline-directed medical therapies um, that we use for uh, heart failure with reduced DF. Okay, and then I'll talk briefly about genetic dilated cardiomyopathy. So <clears throat> one question here, if anyone wants to answer, so which of the following is true regarding genetic testing in patients with dilated cardiomyopathy? So genetic testing has an important role in the prognostic assessment of most dilated cardiomyopathy patients. A negative genetic test in the index patient excludes a familial form of cardiomyopathy. Dilated cardiomyopathy patients with mutations in troponin T are less likely to respond to standard medical therapies. Or number four, the best potential use of genetic testing is in family screening algorithms. Option four. Yeah, option four. Right, so none of these other things are true. So we really don't have a huge role in, in uh, understanding the prognosis when we have a positive genetic test in a patient with dilated cardiomyopathy. I think this will continue to evolve and hopefully one day we will. A negative genetic test certainly does not exclude a familial form of cardiomyopathy. And if you have a strong family history, that should still be high on uh, the differential for etiology. And then basically the best way that we can use, and I work closely with Dr. Hinson with a lot of these patients, the best way that we use the genetic testing is by testing the proban, the person with, that's affected. And if a specific gene is identified that's associated with dilated cardiomyopathy, then that specific gene can be used to test, uh, sort of cascade test other first degree family members. And that helps when we're following the family members clinically as far as uh, screening. So if they are gene positive or, and phenotype negative, then we can come up with a screening strategy for monitoring. If they're gene negative, then that's, that's pretty helpful. It doesn't mean they can't develop some other type of dilated cardiomyopathy, but it means that they're not, you know, not uh, at risk for the um, one that's identified by the gene in the first degree relative. So the genetics of dilated cardiomyopathy quite complicated. There are 60 plus um, loci and genes associated with dilated cardiomyopathy. Um, most of them encode the sarcomere, the nuclear envelope, and the cytoskeletal proteins. And gene mutations are identified in about 40% of familial dilated cardiomyopathy. I still send patients that have, you know, if I have patients that have a dilated cardiomyopathy, sort of of any type I, that's not ischemic, I tend to send them for genetic testing. Um, because I think that, you know, it can be informative. Um, sometimes we find a genetic mutation that might not have been potentially expecting. And as our knowledge continues to grow, um, I think that having a broad depth of genetic data is, is going to be helpful for our future therapies. So familial dilated cardiomyopathy um, inheritance, the majority of autosomal, uh, the majority is made up of autosomal dominant dilated cardiomyopathy. And autosomal recessive dilated cardiomyopathy makes up about 16%. Uh, these patients are at a younger age, usually of onset, and unfortunately have a more rapid progression. There's X-linked dilated cardiomyopathy that occurs in about 10% of the patients. Um, common, the commonly presentation of males with severe progressive heart failure and often related to dystrophin mutations. And there are different patterns that you can see. So you can have some with or without conduction system disease and with or without skeletal myopathy. So dilated cardiomyopathy without conduction system disease is sort of the most common phenotype. Most of these are made up by mutations in the sarcomere. It's about 30% of them. And different mutations in the same genes uh, can cause hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Titan truncations are another uh, very common gene found in the dilated cardiomyopathy and present in up to about 20% of this idiopathic um, dilated cardiomyopathy group. <clears throat> 
in two to three percent of phenotypically normal patients um, when doing the cascade testing you can detect the gene and men often carry a worse prognosis than women so disease dilated cardiomyopathy excuse me, cardiomyopathy with conduction system disease is also another variant to be aware of. There's lamin mutation, so LMNA, um, and that's the nuclear envelope proteins that are mutated in emery dreyfus muscular dystrophy as well as progeria. So I've been sent some of these patients from neurology with some sort of muscular dystrophy and then screening and testing is considered for um, uh, cardiomyopathy associated. This makes up about 8% of dilated cardiomyopathy, and you'll often see AV block and atrial arrhythmias. And you can anticipate progression in the onset of ventricular arrhythmias. And they might have a concomitant skeletal myopathy. So these patients sort of come either way, either you know, to, to us first for evaluation of a dilated cardiomyopathy, and you may uh, find on review of systems a skeletal abnormality, a skeletal muscle abnormality as well, and refer to neuro neurology or the other way around. And then the SCN5A mutations um, are a cardiomyopathy that accompanies conduction system disease and commonly presents with sinoatrial node dysfunction and atrial arrhythmias, which are very common. So about 43% of those folks have early onset atrial fibrillations. And you've also identified mutations in the LQT3 and with Brugada syndrome. So many other types, X-linked dilated cardiomyopathy, we talked about briefly. So mutations in uh, the dystrophin genes with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy and Becker's muscular dystrophy. So always to have that on your radar as far as what to look for. And if I hadn't sent a patient like this or in the previous slides from neurology with a concern for um, a systemic disorder or inherited disorder that can be associated with a dilated cardiomyopathy, there's not clear indication for us as a cardiologist of how how to screen going forward if they're sort of phenotype negative from a cardiomyopathy standpoint. I've been operating on the doing a once a year um, clinical evaluation um, plus minus echo, but that really hasn't been um, defined in these cases. So that's an area um, of further development. And then there's also mitochondrial gene mutations, which are associated with cardiomyopathy and sensory neural hearing loss. Um, one more to think about that I think we're identifying more and more frequently is LV non-compaction. So this is what LV non-compaction looks like. By echo here, you see that there's this portion of the endocardium that normally during fetal development is um, essentially flush up with the rest of the myocardium here. And, and unlike sort of the right ventricle where we expect to see a fair amount of trabeculation, um, in, the, in the left ventricle, we really should not see a large amount of trabeculation here in the apex. And this is what it looks like on a cardiac MRI. So a fair amount of this sort of trabeculated portion of the um, endocardium and LV apex. And by gross histopathology here as well, you can see this sort of profound trabeculation in both chambers. Um, <clears throat> which you can imagine how this can um, certainly alter uh, cardiac function. And over time, you can develop a dilated cardiomyopathy with this uh, underlying um, abnormality. So LV non-compaction is thought to be run in families, and there seems to be some familial link, but we don't have sort of a high... Um, uh, we don't have a high yield from doing genetic testing in these patients. Um, I still send them just again to sort of uh, broaden our, our database um, as far as looking for or identifying in the future genes that might be associated. But at this point, it's not clear that there's a gene we can test for and then cascade test other family members. So these patients with LV non-compaction are at increased risk for developing LV dilation as well as heart failure. And it's really very variable as to how patients will present and, and progress over time. So possible increased risk for sudden cardiac death. So if I find LV non-compaction, I'll usually do some sort of evaluation for ventricular arrhythmia, like either just a halter to look for um, um, uh, ventricular arrhythmia that's not uh, symptomatic or even consider as uh, exercise treadmill tests if they're having symptoms with activity. And at this point, it is suggested that these patients avoid competitive athletics. So making the diagnosis is really important as far as um, understanding what the risk for uh, 
athletics and for sort of sudden cardiac death is. And then the other thing to think about with LV non-compaction is the systolic function and how that relates to sort of treatment. So at this point, we treat uh, patients with low systolic function as stage B or C heart failure. So if they've had signs or symptoms of heart failure in the past, um, then, then you treat them with the sort of routine guideline directed medical therapy, but there's not a ton of data on how they respond. Um, and then we also think about uh, anticoagulation if the ejection fraction is low. And I've had some patients that have presented actually with a stroke, and in the evaluation of, for etiology of stroke, you find that they have LV non-compaction. Um, and that have, I've seen that more than I've sort of anticipated. So thinking about um, uh, anticoagulation in these patients is really an important factor. And if you find LV non-compaction <clears throat> and the systolic function is normal, then thinking about just sort of treating as stage B heart failure, so optimizing all other potential um, uh, comorbidities that can result in cardiac dysfunction, and thinking about something like maybe an ACE or a beta blocker. Um, <clears throat> Unexplained syncope or any symptoms of palpitations, I always evaluate for ventricular arrhythmias. It's also commonly uh, uh, present as well. Okay, so I think we're about time. So in summary, the dilated cardiomyopathies <clears throat> are made up of many different etiologies and they have very variable uh, courses in natural history. The reason to spend so much time trying to identify the etiology is in order to identify things that have a treatable underlying etiology or that are reversible. And I highlighted many of the common reversible cardiomyopathy causes of dilated cardiomyopathy. And then in an effort to identify any underlying etiology, um, in the more recent years, we have more advanced imaging, specifically with cardiac MRI, which really helps to, to further delineate characteristics of the myocardium that help to determine what the etiology is and if it's treatable. And then thinking more and more about genetic testing, and the way I explain it to the patient is that at this time, it doesn't change the way that we treat them, but it helps us to think about um, helps to give a reason as to why this happened because 50% of these dilated cardiomyopathies being idiopathic, it's very um, frustrating for patients that they often don't come up, you know, we often don't have a reason why this happened. And the genetic testing, I think when they're, when it's um, positive, when we do find something there, that is at least helpful in that sense where there's now there's a reason um, and then potentially in the future, there might be a sort of genetic therapy. And, and I think that's the way I sort of speak with patients about it. And I do think that it's helpful in that aspect very much so. And then <clears throat> most, you know, very important concept is treating the underlying etiology when able. So I usually, if I'm sending someone with half ref, um, I always describe sort of what is the underlying etiology because we don't want to just say, okay, guideline directed medical therapy, as much as I harp on that as well. Um, if there's a reversible underlying etiology, let's first of all look for it and then um, see if there's any potential opportunity to treat it. So that's why I usually will push forward with something like advanced imaging with cardiac MRI, even considering biopsy and then genetic testing to try to identify these other um, subspecialized etiologies. I think that's all I have for you guys. Let me know if you have any questions at all.